Praise God. You know, heaven is, uh, church is not just an institution or a place where we, we just come and, and fellowship one with another, or, but it's a place where we, heaven and earth, meet. Amen? So we're here today under an open heaven, believing that the Holy Spirit's going to come and touch each one of you in a fresh and a new way. Amen? So I want you to be open now to what the the Holy Spirit is going to do in our midst because we're all in different stages in our journey. And often when a word is preached, uh, the word is touching your spirit and it's not the intention that you remember every word that's ever spoken, but something's ignited in your spirit man. Because it's your spirit that the Holy Spirit wants to touch. He doesn't want to touch your mind. Your mind will process things later, but it's now the word of God is sent forth to touch your spirit man because we're spirit beings. Amen? So we can get caught too too much in trying to think things through rather than allow the Holy Spirit just to, to touch us. Let me see if I can just turn this. A better way. Sometimes it turns. Ah, there we go. And sometimes it doesn't. And I was thinking about, I was actually looking at one of the journeys one of my daughter's going through, and it just seems to be over the mountain and down in the valley, and, and it's, it's uh, hard, you know. And I think, wow, you know, we, we all go through highs and lows to reach what we think is a destination. But Are we looking to our destination or are we focused on our destiny? And there's a a great difference. Abraham's father, Turan, when he came out of the Earl of Chaldeans, the Bible said, he was to go to the place of Canaan. But he came, as you know, to Turan. His son was Turan who had died. That was Lot's uh, father. I think I've got it right. But he named that place and he stayed there. And he didn't go forward into Canaan. So he reached a destination and he stayed there. But Abraham was then called, the son was then called to go. And the Lord said to him, get out from your country and from your family and from your father's house. And at any rate, Abraham followed the word of the Lord. Because he had now not just a destination, but he had a destiny in mind. Because God said, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. Now, nothing in his life showed that any of those things were there. There was no fruit of it as far as he was concerned. He was a young man, or probably he wasn't. Maybe he was 80 when he left there with his father. They lived so so long. But it, it wasn't in his thinking But God planted destiny. He said, I'll make you a great nation. I will bless you. I'll make your name great. Ah, And you will be a blessing. And I will bless those. And and I will bless those who bless you. And I'll curse him who curses you. And you and all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, that's destiny. But he didn't just automatically jump into destiny. There was a process in coming to fulfillment of what God wants for us. And in fact, Abraham had the greatest test of his faith when I've spoken about it before, when he got involved in the battle of the kings because in this battle, Lot had been taken captive, his nephew. And so Abraham got involved in this battle that wasn't his battle and it should never have been his battle because he should never have taken Lot with him because God didn't tell him to take Lot with him. But then he got involved in this battle and he went and he rescued with his 316 or how many soldiers he had in his house and trained soldiers and he went and he rescued his nephew. And he came back. Now, do you remember when Abraham, prior to all of this, he had gone into Egypt and he had lied and he'd told that his wife to be his sister and at any rate to 
Pharaoh was so upset with him and told him, you know, that he could have even taken his wife. Why did he lie? And he asked him to leave and, and he gave him riches. He gave him cows. He gave him all, all the wealth. So Abraham, out of deception and lying, had left Egypt a very rich man. And now here he is later and he's rescued Lot from this battle and the king of, uh, king of Salem comes up to him, King Mechizeldek, the king of peace, the king of Jerusalem. And he meets him and he, he gives him bread and wine. He has communion with him. I mean, this is prophetic in itself. And, and, and Abraham, he serves him bread and wine and and he says, blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and bless God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And then he gave him a tenth. Abraham gave to the king McKissel tenth, a tenth of all that he had. And, uh, but prior to that, the the king uh, of um, Sodom, when Lot had res- when he had rescued Lot, the king of Sodom had come up to him and he said, "Look, you can have whatever you want. I'll, I'll, I'll give you whatever you want." And Abraham said to him, "He said, "I won't take anything from you. I won't even take a strap for my sandals because I don't want." God to think that I've taken anything that he hasn't given to me. So Abraham had learned his lesson and and he said, I have raised my hand. Then he said, Abraham said, I have raised my hand, he said at this communion, to the Lord God, most high possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take anything that is ours, lest you should say I have made Abraham rich. Now, At this point in the story, this was a whole challenge for Abraham. Abraham could have, at this point, aborted his destiny. It was a test and a a test of his faith. Was he going to go on into the old ways or was he going to allow God to be who he wanted to be and to work out destiny in his life? Was he going to trust God? And so we come to these destinations in life. And God allows various destinations and experiences to shape us. But it's not the end. It's to bring us into his destiny. But you try and tell that to somebody who's broken. You try and tell somebody that that's, that's suffering a marriage breakup or they've lost their job. And you, you say, but God is in this. God is with you. God will turn this. He will make, he turns everything for good. He brings good out of every. Every experience. But we get caught up in our destinations. We think, this is who I am now. I'm a a separated woman. I'm a divorced woman. I'm a widow. I'm a widower. I'm unemployed. And we get caught up thinking that that destination is all there is. But you forget destiny. God has called you. He's placed a seed in your life, and that seed will produce the life that God has called it to produce. I won't jump ahead. So for all these destinations, God will shape us and fashion us. There's no escaping it. And to be used by God is to be tested in all of these trials and all of these situations, but not focus on the destiny not focus on the place that you're at, but focus, focus on destiny rather than the destination you find yourself in. Now, when I was young, I don't know if you were like me, but my destination when I was like 17 was I wanted to be 21. 21 was the destiny. You know, when you're 21, you want to be 30. And, and men, 
Goodness me, you've heard business manuals, they talk about this. Men work so hard to climb this ladder of success and to have their E-type jag and everything by the time they're 40 and they find that the ladder, that success that they've been climbing all this time is up against the wrong wall. And in the process, they've lost their family, their children, the things that they valued, but they've reached a destination. They thought that was it. But God has planted a seed of destiny in your life and in my life. And this seed is marvellous. This, <laughs> this seed in you, in me, is an incorruptible seed. This is an overcoming seed. This is a victorious seed. This is a resolute seed. This, this seed has greatness in it. You have greatness in you because of the seed that is in you. This is Bible. This is Bible. You have been born again, not of a perishable seed, but an imperishable seed, Peter says, through the living and enduring word of God. And this seed that you have in you, I'm telling you, will grow in any environment that you are in. Whatever the environment, whether it's a dry environment, whether it's an oppressive environment, whether it's a persecuted environment, whatever environment you are in, this seed will grow. It's a living seed. It's an incorruptible seed. And it will continue to germinate within you. I went with my sister yesterday walking our dogs and walked through the Adelaide Parklands and they've got an environmental burn-off with some... Um, Aboriginal elders, I think they're sitting in on as well and they're, they're only burning certain parts of the park. And if you look closely, there are clumps of grasses that they've, they've just burned. It's not as if they've just let this fire go wild. But I understand that in the burning, that these new grasses emerge and nature replenishes itself and the environment comes more conducive to more habitat, and it becomes fresh and new. And so this seed in our life is the same. Whatever destination you're in, you allow God. It might take a bit of fire, but I'll tell you what, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the reign of the Holy Spirit will cause that seed within you to germinate. And if you think you're going through a dry and an arid time, you need to just move into the presence of God. Let the, the, the rain of the Holy Spirit come in and soak upon that seed in you. And like a seed in the ground, it, its, its roots are trying to find water. And you don't see it, but as the roots find the water, then, then the sprout begins to appear above the earth. But you don't see it, but God is working in you. You may not see it, but God is working in that seed in you. So that seed in you does not stay dormant. That seed in you, God wants to become a tree. And a tree becomes, it multiplies when the seeds fall to the ground, the tree becomes a forest. And just like when Pastor Ray is talking about your testimony, you're sowing seeds. And the seeds you sow will be gathered by others, taken into their hearts, and they will speak those seeds. Before you know it, you've got a forest. The seed germinates. The seed multiplies. And this is how God increases things. So the seed is that life, that life-giving spirit that we have. We have within us the very seed of victory. You are overcomers because of the seed that you carry. You know, I think of Abraham. Abraham was promised the seed. The seed. And in your seed. Here I go. I've just gotten on. Can I give you this ray for a moment?
Abraham was promised a seed. Well, Abraham had his son, Isaac. Well, Isaac wasn't the seed. He was a carrier of the seed. The seed that was promised is Jesus. We are carriers of the seed. We have Christ in us. This is the amazing part in history that we live in this time. So there's no future apart from the seed that he's planted in your heart. You can try and get other seeds, seeds of the world, but they will not produce anything. It's only the seed of God in your heart that will produce, amen. And so the most interesting thing is that the place of destination is that place that God is working on this seed in your life. But I want you to know that as you're built on his life, nothing will shake you. You will be able to stand in the midst of any storm, in the midst of any trial, because this is an impregnable seed. This seed is, is so strong within you. You are not weak. The seed in you is strong. It is an overcoming seed. And this seed is, is a violent seed. The seed in you that is violent. When, when um, in the book of Genesis it said that, you know, um, he'll cause enmity between the seed of Satan and your seed. And he said, and you will bruise his head and he will bruise your heel. Satan has been defeated. That seed is a violent seed. He is the male seed. He will bruise your head. A male seed, that's the seed that we carry in us. It's a violent seed. It's not a passive seed. It's a seed that when it sees wrong, it'll rise up in righteous anger. It's, it's a violent seed. That's the seed that we carry. It's a righteous seed. It's a good seed. And it's a seed that will shine forth as bright as the noonday sun in the kingdom of God. And I've said it's a male seed. It's victorious, prevailing seed. And it's our destiny to carry this. God said, in the beginning, God said, let us make man in our image and likeness and be fruitful. And then in Colossians 2.9, it says, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. And when this seed is manifested fully in you, as you journey through all these life's valleys and you come to certain destinations, don't stop. Don't abort your journey at the destination that you're now in. You will have valley experience and you will have mountaintop experiences. But we want to get to a place like Paul when he finally could say this, when he who is my life is revealed, then I will be revealed in him. When he who is my life is revealed, then I will be revealed in him. We are not our own. Christ wants to be manifested in and through your life. People want to see Christ in you. They don't want to see you. You might attract with your personality, but they want to see Christ in you. Not so much your personality or charisma, they're looking for Christ. And church for too long has got caught up in charismatic personalities and personalities per se, but where's Christ? And we should be seeing Christ, that seed, that Christ in each one of us. When I look at you, I see Christ. When you look at me, you, see, you don't look at my failings, you see Christ. So that's what I love this voice. When he who is my life 
is revealed. To me, that speaks of destiny. When he who is my life is revealed, then I will be revealed in him. Isn't that beautiful? That's Colossians 3. So it's a violent seed. It's a violent seed. Now, we need to hear this now because these are the days when it will not yield to the devil. We cannot yield to the devil. We carry this violent, overcoming seed. You know, you won't be defined by your scars. Only by the stars, the scars of Christ. And you might say, oh, I've been through this and I carry the scars of this battle. And this is who I am. No, you're defined only by the scars of Jesus Christ. And Joseph could have boasted, I'm getting to a very serious point on this, that's on my heart, but Joseph could have boasted a victim. He could have had more scars than anyone. He was abused. He was abducted by his brothers. He was abused, he was thrown into a pit, he was thrown into prison. He could have promoted himself for all of his scars. He could have been a victim for the rest of his life and lived in victimhood status for his whole life. And he could have got all the government to support him in everything he did because he was a victim of his circumstance of his tribe, of his people. And today, people parade their victimhood as victorious, a victorious badge which, which keeps them bound rather than free in liberty. And it's the freedom, this freedom is f- that for which God came to set us free. We stand firm then. You stand firm and don't let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke, this yoke of bondage that the world and slavery that the world is trying to put on you. The universities in their social political theories enslave our young people every single day by their teachings By these teachings, what they teach is dividing the world, it's bringing destruction, it's fueling hate, it's not bringing love, and these seeds are the tares that are sown by the devil. It's counter to all that God has said and does. Now, I know a little bit about this subject, and it's critical race theory. And this critical race theory is being taught in all the universities. And it goes a bit like this, that unless you're white, you are a victim of past history. A race has been, they say, socially constructed. And therefore, they, anybody who is not white, who is black-skinned or another lighter colour, therefore, they've become victims of a Western white culture. And intersectionality is where the race, the class, where they're classified by their class and and, and power And it intersects with the historical and social factors where all except those of white colour become victims. They're all victims in one way and another. And they interconnect through class or gender, victimhood. And they see themselves, and this is very real, as, as victims of a hegemonic oppression, a dominant power dominating over them. These political and social oppressive powers. And if you're not white, 
then you are a victim of gender, race, class, and power. And people of white colour have to really apologise for their whiteness. They've been given privileges, white privileges. And in the workplace, they have to recognise this white privilege that they have. So this critical race theory is not biblical. They are absolutely blinded by deception. And if you do a study in the Bible, you see that God created man. And we need to understand how to come back at these arguments biblically because of the seed that we carry. It's a violent seed. It's a seed of truth. He did not create separate races or even a separate species. He did not classify hum- humans into a hierarchy. In the early days, he had phrenology, which was a study of the brain. You know, in the years of enlightenment, the 16th, 17th century, and they'd study the brain of the different so-called races, species, to determine their intellect by the shape and the size of the brain. And these all had a part in, in becoming socially constructed views on what race was. And then we had Charles Darwin, the origin of the species, and then uh, he, he's, his cousin who adapted those same principles into, into social uh, structures in society. And it was all about the hierarchy of races, the superiority of a white race from a Western viewpoint. And they say that this is systemic in all of our social structures now. And this is what the fight, they want to dismantle everything, everything, family, institutions, monuments, anything, because it's based on this critical race theory. But we have a violent seed. We have a seed that speaks truth, that is, 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 see, Jesus is the spirit of truth. Adam and Eve were ethnically generic. They represented all ethnic groups. I can't say it, ethnicities. (laughs) Yeah, it's a hard one. But we were created one species, man and woman, human, human. The Bible is not racist. I looked at um, a quote that came from um, Bible Society in the UK, and I think we need to have an understanding because there's reasons why they think this, but it's being used politically to destroy uh, our culture our Western culture and our civilization and our Christian heritage. But in 1917, and I'm reading from this now, the Schofield Bible popularized a reading on the curse of Ham. And this was the account. After he saw his father Noah naked, this was taken without a shred of evidence to refer to the black races. And it was used to justify their continual oppression. And a prophetic declaration is made from that, that Ham was descendant and inferior and was to serve as a a slave, a a servant. Genesis 9.21 is where the account is. And... um, and after Noah woke from his drunken sleep and he was, you know, uh, seen by his son, uh, he said, Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves will be his brothers. Noah then blessed Shem and Japheth, declaring them, Blessed be the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God extend the territory of Japheth and may Canaan be his slave. Well, the context in which that was, was not in which it was presented by biblical scholars of the time. And the religious leaders argued that Ham meant black and referred to the people who were coloured black. And they enslaved people and the policies by this distortion of scripture to yield power over black people and abuse and enslave them. 
And these pastors and writers argued that the word ham really means black or burnt and thus refers to the black race. And uh, it was taken out of context for political purposes. And then a Bible produced in early 1800s for the use of slaves in Britain. Now, this is unbelievable. In the British rule in the West Indies, they removed all the references to freedom. Large parts of it were cut out, including the whole book of Exodus. Not just because the story of Moses liberated the enslaved Hebrews, but because of this verse, Exodus 21.16 Whoever kidnaps a man, either to sell him or keep him as a slave, is to be put to death. So they, they distorted the Bible, cut parts out of the Bible to, to save themselves, to justify themselves from slavery in those days. Now, there are many, many reasons, historical reasons, why people would think that the black races have been oppressed. We only have to look at the founding fathers when they discovered new lands and they found people that they'd never seen before who were unusual. But they moved away from the biblical principles and truths that these people were human beings and they tried to say they were different species. And so we have the Bible and the Bible is truth. And this is, this is the weapon in these days to counteract this critical race theory wherever you hear it because of the seed that you carry. And John 16 says this, this spirit of truth that we carry, when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only of that which he hears and he'll tell you that which is to come. So this seed that you carry is to establish the kingdom of God. This seed that you carry is to rise up under whatever circumstance that you find yourself in, whatever political things are being put on you to oppress you, to quieten you, to to shut you down. Because this is what's happening in the world. They want to shut down the voice of the Christian. They want to shut the prophetic voice. And the seed you carry, you carry a prophetic seed. It's a prophetic seed. What you speak is that which comes from heaven, declaring the future as it is now. We go through these things, but we speak what God says, what the future is. There will be a new heaven and a new earth, but this, this earth won't go up in a flaming ball of fire. It's going to be recreated. It's going to be recreated by the people who carry the message of the kingdom of God, who will speak the word of God into the situations, into the environment, into the political fields. They will speak the word of God to bring the change. They will dismantle by the word of God the structures in the spiritual realm. They'll go into the spiritual realm and do warfare in the spiritual realm and declare what God has spoken and dismantle the principalities and powers in that place. And this world will be recreated because the great thing about history is that God created, recreated man. Jesus became the second, the final, the last Adam. He recreated the species. He recreated man. And it's our place to extend the kingdom as partners with Jesus Christ, as as the fourth part of, of the Godhead in a sense, because if Christ lives in us and the Father and the Son live in Christ and the three live in us, well, we are now a fourth part. We're working with the the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit that live within us. I can speak to the Father. I can speak to Jesus. I can speak to the Holy Spirit. I have the Godhead living inside of me, and they're living inside of me as a temple of the Holy Spirit so that I can extend the kingdom of God. Jesus, when he, before he was resurrected, spent 40 days preaching about the kingdom that was to come. 
the kingdom of God. This is the kingdom age. The church age has stepped into the kingdom age. It's not about our needs. It's not about our wants. It's not about what makes me feel better. It's not about self. It's about Christ. It's about his dominion. It's about his power. And the seed that he's given us is a violent seed. It's a violent seed that will pull down strongholds. It's a violent seed that will not back down from the enemy. And you have that seed. You have that power. You have that impregnable seed within you. Nothing can stand against you. You're not going to abort your destiny. You're not going to pull down because you're defined by your age, that you've reached a destination of 60 or 70, and that's it. No. Destiny is the seed that you carry. Destiny is in you. It's an overcoming seed, so let it rise up. Let it rise up. Let it catch what the Spirit of God is saying today. He's calling the church to arise in the power and know that what he's placed at great cost. He's placed his seed in you and me. And it's not to waste our days. It's not to say I've reached my destination, but to move on in the power of God. And in our weakness we'll be made strong. And we, you know, if our memory's failing, my memory fails me all the time. And I say, God, it's only when I get up by your Holy Spirit because I can't rely on what I know. I have, have to be so absolutely dependent on the Holy Spirit. And I listen to people, I talk to pastors on the phone and I'm amazed at what they know and I feel as if I'm just this quiet little thing listening. But I know when the Holy Spirit comes, when the Holy Spirit moves, that wow, it's like a river, wow, it's like a fire. And that's the seed. That's Christ in us. That's the Father living in us. That's the Holy Spirit in us. So don't look on yourself. Yourself is nothing. Yourself is dead. It died. You're dead. You died with Christ. It's Christ living in you. It's Christ the hope of glory. It's Christ that's the living water. It's Christ that's the river of life. And that river will flow out of you. Because of the seed, the seed that you watered, it becomes a river of living water, of life. He wants us to be life givers because of the seed that we carry. The words we speak bring life to raise people up, to fulfill their destiny. That's what we're called to do. Not to back down, not to retreat, not to abort in the face of the enemy. To to advance. Every step is a step of advancement. There's a giant, give me another giant. Is that all you can do? That's the seed. That's the seed that you carry. That's the seed that I carry. It's a violent seed. It's an impregnable seed. It's a victorious seed. It's an overcoming seed. We don't walk in fear. We don't walk in failure. What's failure? What somebody says? You're moving through these destinations toward a destiny. And God is at work in you. In all of these situations, he's shaping you. He's refining you. He's taking bits off you and and putting other bits in. And Christ is being more manifested in your brokenness and in your pain. It's Christ in you. And I'll find that verse again to finish on. I'll have to commit it to heart. That words of Peter. I may not be able to find it quickly. That's all right. That's all right. So, Father, I just thank you. I thank you, Father, that these people here, Lord, carry a magnificent, oh, victorious, overcoming, impregnable, violent seed, Father God, your seed in them. 
Father, I just thank you right now, Father, that every restriction, every spirit of bondage that's been on them will be broken in Jesus' name. Every spirit of fear and intimidation will come off them in Jesus' name right now. Every spirit that says failure, come off in Jesus' name right now. I release wholeness. I release healing. I release a sense of victory, a sense of overcoming. I sense now your spirits are rising to a new level. I sense the spirit water level in this place is rising right now. There's, this, there's a rising now in the spirit level. I want you to just immerse yourself in it right now. I just want you to see all those things broken off you, those things that have defined you, those words you've spoken over your lives that have defined you and limited you. I just break those off in Jesus' name. The church has no boundaries. You have no boundaries. You make your boundaries by your own thinking. You're a spirit being. Break free. Break the boundaries. Break every chain, every restriction this day in Jesus' name. Don't be defined by your physical weakness. Don't be defined by your mental ability. But be defined by what Christ has placed inside of you. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old is gone. You are not under the spirit of bondage, but you've been given the spirit of liberty, Galatians says. Hallelujah. 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 Death, where is thy sting? Your destiny is not death. Death, where is thy sting? You've got eternal life. You've got resurrection life. Hallelujah. That's the truth. You live in resurrection life. Let that be your statement. Oh, Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, I live by the power of the living God. I live in resurrection life. And that speaks to your body. When I say to people, I live in resurrection life, I'm speaking to my body. I'm telling my body it's coming into resurrection life. It lives in resurrection life. Father, I thank you. Just receive now wherever you are. Just reach out to God. Reach out to God. You want to be set free of every limitation, every statement, every word, every curse that's come upon you. I break off you in Jesus' name. I break it off in Jesus' name. You'll fulfill the destiny that God has called you into. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You are a can-do people. You are a can-do people. You are the army of the living God. You are not alone. You've got the whole Godhead inside of you. And you've got a great host of army, heavenly armies around you. Oh, Father, Lord, we thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, touch each one right now. Where they are, Lord God. Lord, I prophesy that this day will be a day like no other that every chain has been broken off, Father. Every, everything that was limiting them, Father, in their mind and in their body is broken off this day. I charge that they will come up into a new level today, that, Lord, they will, they will rise above their circumstances and they'll come into a new level. They'll come into, a, I, do, I prophesy, you'll come into a new spiritual stature this day. The level of your spirit will have increased this day. There's been enlargement. In your spirit man this day, there's been an enlargement. God wants you to know he's enlarging, enlarging your, your spirit, enlarging even your territory this day, says the Lord, because I have called you to extend my kingdom. 
Wherever you are, there's going to be an enlargement. I see walls, family walls, the divided families coming down right now in Jesus' name. I see there's going to be reconciliation between fathers and sons and fathers and daughters in Jesus' name. There's going to be reconciliation even in partners who have separated. They'll find uh, the grace to be able to communicate with one another. I, I speak to all divisions across the body of Christ. And I say the healing, reconciling power of Jesus Christ is coming into this body this day in Jesus' name. God is raising up this body to be a mighty army, healed and delivered of every demonic force. I thank you, Father God. Lord, I thank you for this seed, this seed that you placed in us, Father God. Lord, I thank you that your kingdom will advance. And I bless these people right now in Jesus' name. Everyone, Father. Heal their bodies. Heal the bodies of sickness and disease. It's not of you, Father. It's not of you, Father. Sin and sickness came as a result of original sin. Even Satan didn't, uh, didn't um, uh, create sin, create sickness. But he did. He did cause sin to come. And as a result, sin and sickness. So, Father, I just thank you. That, Lord, we look to you. We don't look with a, uh, we look uh, not with a sin consciousness, but with a God consciousness in everything we do, Father God. We look to the finished work on the cross, Father. We look to the ultimate destiny, the ultimate uh, plan that you have for humanity, Father God. And we just uh, are so grateful that, Lord, we live in this historical new age where we are new creations, Father. And, Lord, when the history forever changed, and, Lord, we just thank you that this is the kingdom age, the church age, and we give you praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. Bless you all, one by one. Bless you. Receive it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah.